ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Rochelle Travers, and this is The Leader. Tensions are rising over nurse strikes. If Mr Barkley wishes to meet with me and get round the table and stop the spin and start to speak, um, he can avert these strikes. But my door is wide open, night and day. I will make myself available, as will my team, on behalf of our nursing staff. That option isn't open to me at this point in time. And consequently, he has chosen strikes over speaking to me. Royal College of Nursing General Secretary Pat Cullen speaking on BBC Breakfast there, in response to comments by the Health Secretary Steve Barclay. Nurses will go on strike on two days next month as part of a major escalation in a dispute over pay. Dozens of trusts will see nurses walk out on the 15th and 20th of December. It's a tricky time of year for the NHS at the best of times, but the RCN say they've been left with no alternative. Daniel Keane is the Evening Standards health reporter. So I think the impact could be quite severe and we're likely to see quite a lot of regional variation probably in services because the actual strikes vary by region. So what we do know is that emergency care won't be affected. So nobody's going to turn up in A&E and not have any care because of the strikes. However, what we're likely to see is an impact on routine services. So if you're trying to get your knee or hip replaced, then you could face a delay. And we're probably going to see other services like cancer treatment or urgent testing. They might be partially staffed. So you could face a delay there. But in terms of how bad it could get, I think the real difficulty for this is that the NHS is already battling a really tough winter. We have a backlog of over 7 million people that are waiting for treatment. So it's probably really going to impact the progress the NHS is making on that. And we also have um, quite a lot of hospital beds occupied by flu patients, very long waiting times in A&E. So it's coming on top of what I think was already going to be one of the toughest, if not the toughest, winter in NHS history. And it's adding to that. But it's also important to note this is part of seven different health unions that are set to strike. So it's kind of part of a wider movement, not just nurses. And that's where I think it will cause real difficulties. How many London trusts will be affected? So London has less trust striking than some other regions of the country, uh, which will obviously influence the impact. So there's nine trusts and then you have two integrated care boards and uh, something called NHS resolution. But the nine trusts are are the really important ones for patients to know about. So while you only have nine trusts, you have some of London's biggest hospitals involved within that. So you've got Great Ormond Street uh, and the Royal Marsden, which are obviously very well known for cancer care. So there's likely to be an impact there. And then you also have really massive hospitals like Guys in St. Thomas. So I think another thing to note in terms of the impacts on London particularly is that the first strike will be taking place during a week of rail strikes, which already have quite a significant impact on hospitals, whether that's sort of staff or patients traveling to the hospital. So I think in this key winter period, even though there are slightly less hospitals in London that are striking, say, compared to the Southwest or the Northwest, we're still going to see quite a lot of disruption. How has it got to this point? This is a very long running dispute. And I think it's really important to note that this is the first time the Royal College of Nursing has ever done this, ever. So it's a really, really big deal. Uh, It's not kind of a dispute that has ever escalated to this stage. So what they want is a rise of a pay rise of 5% above RPI inflation, which is currently around 14%. So you're looking at a 19% pay rise. Uh, The government hasn't offered anything close to that. So they've offered a guaranteed rise of at least £1,400 for NHS staff, which is about, I think, 4.75%. So you can just see with the the two numbers there that they are really a world apart on this. It's like a sort of 15% difference. So the RCN claimed that the pay award came after years of squeezes that were already there on nurses' salaries. They say the average pay for a nurse has fallen 6% between 2011 and 2021. So their argument is this lack of pay has significantly impacted morale and actually the NHS's ability to retain and attract nurses into the profession. And so obviously what happens when, when you have staffing shortages is morale drops and they argue that there is a real impact on care from this. So part of the RCN's argument is that patients actually are in danger because of staff shortages and low morale, which is caused by low pay. 
Strikes seem to be everywhere at the moment. How has this announcement gone down in general? Is there a lot of empathy for nurses? I think that there is. Well, I think there's quite a lot of empathy for a lot of people who are going on strike because the cost of living crisis is impacting all of us across the public sector, particularly. I think also after the COVID pandemic, the public support and the enthusiasm for nurses and what they do is just so high. And actually, when people look at pay, when they see that the starting salary for a nurse is just over around £27,000 a year, in the current economic climate, a lot of people would think that is just too low. Now, of course, as you progress through the pay bands in the NHS, you do get more money, but um, it can be quite difficult to, to progress through those pay bands. So I think the argument that Pat Cullen and, and the RCN are making make a lot of sense to people. The difficulty, of course, will be if a significant amount of people who are already on a waiting list for a long time have their operations delayed further and their treatment or their, their diagnosis delayed. And there's a, there's a material impact of this, then I think perhaps public opinion might change. But my strong suspicion is that, that the public is really with the nurses on this. Could there be more strikes announced? Uh, yes, I, I think that, that unfortunately for, for everyone, really, this is going to be quite a long running dispute. If you look at the kind of language that, that Steve Barclay, the health secretary, is using, he's basically saying that the pay demands are not affordable. He won't discuss pay. That's why we've been led to this strike in the first place, as he said, I'm not going to talk about pay. And that the sort of challenging economic climate that we're in just means that the pay rise that they want cannot be paid for. Unfortunately, that, that economic climate isn't going to change anytime soon. We know in the autumn statement that the government kind of set targets on, on bringing down the deficit. So I think that ministers probably worry that if they were to give nurses a significant pay rise, then of course, everybody else in the public sector, not just in the NHS, would be demanding the same sort of rise. So I suspect they may be able to meet in the middle. I mean, there could be a compromise. I don't want to be too negative. But this one could run on for quite a while. But it all depends on, of course, how impactful the strikes are, how much disruption do they cause? And does Steve Barkley just want to kind of pay them what they feel they deserve and, and get on with it? Let's go to the ads. Stay there to hear Sadiq Khan on why he's expanding ULES to cover the whole of London. Welcome back. The Mayor of London has announced that the ultra-low emission zone will be expanded to cover the whole of the capital. From next summer, drivers of the most polluting cars will have to pay £12.50 a day to enter the Greater London Authority boundary. As a result, an estimated 5 million Londoners will breathe cleaner air. Ross Lydell, our City Hall editor and transport editor, met up with Sadiq Khan after the Evening Standard's Plug It In Summit in London to discuss his reasons for the expansion. I've decided to expand the ultra-low emission zone so it covers all of uh, London for the simple reason that we've got to be tackling the triple challenges of air pollution, climate change and uh, congestion. And just like four million Londoners are already breathing clean air because of the ultra-low emission zone and its expansion to the north and south circular, I want an, a, another five million Londoners to also benefit from clean air. What were the results of the consultation? Because there was some confusion or controversy around leaked results. Can you give us a, an overview of how many responded, how many were in favour, how many were against? So the report I was given by Transport for London, uh, undertaken by AECOM, analysed uh, a number of things. The consultation undertaken this summer uh, included the results of the UCOV poll, but also a response from uh, stakeholders. Uh, all of the concerns raised by those who responded have been addressed in my response today in relation to the size of the scrappage scheme in relation to the biggest ever expansion of buses in outer London, in relation to the extension of the grace period for those who are disabled, those who are wheelchair users, in relation to the announcements today of uh, further support for community transport and for uh, charities, and also in relation to the other stuff we're doing to support people make a transition. In terms of numbers, uh, the Yuga Bowl showed that almost twice as many people are in favour of expansion uh, as are uh, against it. But in terms of numbers to the consultation, more people were against the expansion than were for it. Now, I've been quite clear, this was a consultation, uh, not a referendum, and we've taken on board uh, all the issues raised during the consultation. How many people will have to pay 
the ULEZ when it goes across Greater London in terms of how many non-compliant vehicles just now or, or projected by next August are registered in London. What we do know from uh, the last few years of the ultra emission zone is we've seen a massive increase in the number of uh, compliant vehicles. We've also seen a massive decrease in the number of non-compliant vehicles. So in 2017, when I first announced the policy, uh, there were only 39% of vehicles in London that were compliant. Uh, a month before uh, we expanded the ULES to North and South Circular, that had increased 85%. A month after it had increased to 94%. In outer London, 85% of vehicles are compliant. On the borders of uh, the North and South Circular out of London, it's uh, 90%. You've got to throw into the mix though, uh, that half of Londoners don't own a car. In outer London, more households have a car than in central and inner London. But we also know that those who don't own a car suffer the worst consequences. One of the reasons why the scrappage scheme is so huge, no support from the government, 110 million pounds, is to help as many people as possible transition from a pollution vehicle to a clean one. We've also made changes to the scrappage scheme. So now families will also have the option of receiving travel cards, which give them free travel uh, over a period of time on public transport in uh, London. And we're also giving uh, charities and businesses the opportunity, to, uh, and families, the opportunity to retrofit their vehicle if they prefer to do that. Just to be clear, so that I'm sure I've understood you, did you essentially say about 10% of vehicles in the outer donut, if you like, the outer ring, will probably not be compliant and have to F pay? So, so, so 15%, 15. 15 uh, are non-compliant, but we also know once we announce a policy and it goes live, a number of those people become uh, compliant. And that's why the experience from central and inner is so important. Tell me about the scrappage scheme. Will it be the same as the £2,000 grant that was available under the North-South Circular scrappage scheme? The scrappage scheme we're going to go with is very different from the old scrappage scheme. We've taken on board uh, the response to the consultation. So the size is far bigger, £110 million, pounds, but also the eligibility is uh, wider in relation to who is eligible, uh, the, the size of the support you receive, but also the options you are given uh, as well. Uh, and it's really important to support as many Londoners as we can. We're particularly focused on supporting uh, low-income Londoners, on supporting disabled Londoners, on supporting charities and supporting small businesses. That's our focus. The figures show that certainly with uh, up to the North-South Circular, uh, there's about 96% compliance for cars, but for, if you like, vans, white van man, it's about 83%. Mm. I'd imagine it'd be similar for the, the wider zone. So if the scrappage scheme is to benefit disabled Londoners and low-income Londoners, it feels that the wider, the Greater London ULEZ will actually primarily target white van man. Is that correct? The size of support small businesses receive is bigger than the size of support uh, a car receives, uh, because obviously they're more expensive to replace. Uh, you know, a non-compliant van with a compliant uh, van. But there's the additional uh, option now, which there wasn't before retrofit, which is a big change. And so broadly speaking, there are changes, but broadly speaking, a thousand pounds for a motorbike, 2,000 pounds for a car, 5,000 pounds for a van, yeah, that's shorthand. Okay, you, your previous scrappage scheme, I know you said it was different, but about 15,200 vehicles were taken off the road, but it was massively oversubscribed. That was 62 million pounds. If you up to 110 million pounds, it'll be probably fewer than 30,000 vehicles that you're able to take off the road. Is that a fair calculation? I think we're going to wait and see. I mean, the good news is uh, we've we've uh, given people lots of notice, but also we'll have an ex uh, an extension of the grace period for disabled drivers uh, as well. The, the key uh, thing also to say is that anyone is eligible to apply in London. So if you missed out on the scrapper scheme from Central Inner London, you can still apply for this scheme, but you've got to be obviously a London resident to uh, apply. Uh, you know, the government gave us zero support, not just last time with the £61 million, but with this £110 million. In fact, it was a condition of the COVID funding deal that none of the TfL uh, revenue or receipts or capital could be used for this. So this is GLA funded. I've had to, this week, find £25 million to try and avoid the government cuts in our buses uh, and I found £110 million pounds for this and later on in February and March uh, you'll see me having to make tough choices not being able to do the stuff I want to do with this £135 million pounds because you know I think there's no choice but to save our buses but also to give people support uh, uh, as we approach the ultra emission zone. And just finally on Ulez, those who were opposed to it said good policy but not now please Mr Mayor because of the cost of living crisis. Mm -hmm. 
Um, how much positive thought did that give you? you know, did you think quite hard about going ahead with next August or consider pausing it? This was a tough decision. It's probably one of the toughest decisions uh, I've made since being a politician. And that includes 11 years as a parliamentarian and six years as a, a mayor. I've factored in a number of things, the costs of inaction versus the costs of action. You know, political expediency uh, often trumps uh, public health. Uh, in this case, it hasn't. Uh, but also I've been like the fact that, you know, my political opponents have been against most things that have been progressive in the recent past. They haven't just been against ultra emission zone in central London, ultra emission zone uh, expansion. The same people were against me voting to ban smoking in public places. These same people were against a uh, sugar tax. And so when you look at history, uh, you know, the Clean Air Act in the 1950s, there were people opposed to those brave politicians. Frankly speaking, uh, because of the cost of living crisis, had I not been able to uh, put forward a massive scrappage scheme of the size I have, uh, I may have delayed this, uh, but the scrappage scheme is so huge, but also the numbers in relation to uh, the numbers of people who don't own a car and suffer poor health, but also the top 10 boroughs, well, I should say the worst 10 boroughs in London, with the premature deaths from Bromley, more than 200, uh, down to the, in the top 10, uh, you know, Redbridge and those sorts of boroughs, it's not acceptable for there to be 200 brief families every year. And so, you know, it's an issue of social justice, an issue of racial justice, but also an issue of a uh, public health crisis. And that's it from The Leader. This podcast is back on Monday at 4pm.